I think it will. So hopefully you can see my screen. I've just quickly introduced myself. So what I'll do is I'll get cracking with this session. So obviously a lot of changes happened in early years and computing unbelievably was taken out of the early years curriculum, which I can't quite understand why that's happened. But the reason I've put this session on is because in terms of computational thinking, and I'll go on to what that is, is in a moment, early years practitioners do it so well that I often encourage key stage two teachers to come down into early years and actually see what you're doing. Because when we hit kind of, and I see this, see this through teaching in many schools, even in classes that I've taught, by the time children are hitting key stage two, this idea of independence, working, problem solving, they find really, really hard. And when you track back mm -hmm. to early years teachers mm -hmm. and early years settings, those children are doing it, they're going off, they're exploring, they're tinkering, they're collaborating with each other, they're solving problems themselves. And it's because early years teachers are very good at planning out the resources and the topics that the, the children are going to work on to enable that child initiated learning. So just the aims of the statutory guidance for early years, every child deserves the best possible start in their life and the support that enables them to fill their potential. This is a key part. And if you think about, I've been teaching 18 years, I've gone from using a overhead projector to whiteboards, screens, projectors. So in terms of the difference in my career, not allowing children that access to just even fundamental parts of computational thinking, I think doesn't set them up. And we, we, we really, really want, and it's, I've put it in the middle, we want them to have that school readiness. We want them to have those skills that they don't feel worried about something that they're quite happy to have a go. And that's something that we really, really harness in early years, I would say. So giving children a broad range of knowledge and skills when they are at home and especially over this last 18 months, computing has been a massive part of it. So to step back away from that seems almost quite cool. They've learned all these new skills. They're having a go. They're interested. And any session I've done that involves iPads, robots, or just unplugged computing activities, the children jump on it and they're really keen to have a go. So it's looking at developing this broad and balanced range of skills that we do in early years, developing this positive relationship with computing, because I meet a lot of teachers who just find it a bit overwhelming at times. So if we want to build this up, this idea of perseverance, this idea of tinkering, collaborating, having a go, understanding where we've gone wrong, we need to build it from the get go, from the moment they come into school. It's just part of their normal behaviours okay so where does computational thinking fit into the early years curriculum so yes i know it's changed and when i look at computational thinking we're looking at developing children's and igniting their enthusiasm for learning and helping them to build the capacity to learn so where it fits in is it fits into communication and language it fits into physical development it fits into that personal social and emotional development being able to work with other children and understand that their thoughts are different to mine and that i'm not going to get my own way all the time that's a key thing that children need to learn to do it fits into literacy it fits into mathematics understanding of the world well technology is a massive part of the world and when you start talking to adults and when you start talking to their parents and find out the jobs that their, their parents are doing most jobs now have technology as part of it so not to introduce the children to it you know from the moment they start understanding it I think you know it's, it's not doing them the best that we can and it's technology links into art and design it's a massive part of art and design as well so in terms of where does it fit in it fits into everywhere it fits into the earliest curriculum so it's just one aspect of it so why is computational thinking important in the earliest it's problem solving, OK? It closely aligns with the characteristics of effective learning. That's where it fits in, OK? Aligning um, computational thinking ensures progress through, through teachers using things like the same vocabulary. If we introduce it like we do with phonics and maths, um, with anything that we're doing, the language that we're using is really, really important. So if we're using it from the moment they come into school, it means by the time they hit key stage one, they've already got an understanding of what debug means or tinker or collaborate. We might not use that specific term, but they understand that what we're talking about. It supports school readiness and gives them a broad range of knowledge and skills. OK, and that is in the statutory framework for early years. It's building that school readiness. And that's part of it. So. I found this document, which I've just put the link on the right hand side, but it's using digital technology to improve learning. So when you are 
bringing in technology or using computational thinking in the early years, it's not a matter of just doing it. It's a matter of planning it and thinking about how it best supports those children. And there's a lot at the moment, especially in the northeast, um, which we're working towards, which is looking at children's um, access to technology in the wider environment, which means, for example, at home, some children don't have that access. And you'll probably have spotted that over lockdown, that some children have found it really, really hard to access technology to work at home. And it's about if we don't provide that opportunity for them in school, obviously they're not going to have these skills and they're already kind of at a deficit in terms of their knowledge and understanding. So it says here, for example, one, consider how technology will improve teaching. Only do it if it's going to improve teaching. You don't want to add it in if it's just going to be a pain or if you know it's not going to work. Um, and think about the topic that you're teaching. Whenever I go into schools, I don't start with computing. I ask the teachers, what topics are you doing? You know, what, what, how am I going to fit computing into what you're already doing? OK, two, technology can be used to improve the quality and explanation. Children are really, really good at seeing something modelled, scaffolding it, showing you them how it's used and what they're going to do. And then the children replicate that. It's a fantastic way of learning. And then the children, especially children who are non-verbal, get the opportunity to really model what they know because they can physically do it. OK, number three, technology offers a way to improve the impact of pupil practice. So as I said before, children having it modelled to them, having it scaffolded, you don't have to have a lot of gear in your classroom to do it. And it can be unplugged, which I'll talk a little, a little bit about that later on. But it helps people practice if they're using it early on. It means by the time they hit key, key stage one, they know how to turn on an iPad. They know how to maybe use a robot. They've already got these skills that we want to keep building on. And for technology can play a role in improving assessment and feedback. So it helps us support because we, if we stand back and watch the children, which is what we do in early years in terms of assessment, finding out asking those effective questions what what have the children understood and part of the resources i'll show you have all of these key questions so if you want support in terms of what kind of questions should i be asking them how do i ask an open question where the children can start to explain what do i do with those non-verbal children that don't actually respond but i want to find out what they do know all the resources i will show you have kind of those ideas in as well so using digital technology to improve learning, consider how technology will improve the teaching. So only do it if it's necessary. You don't have, it's, technology is there to support what you're doing. It's not there to be a hindrance or, you know, and I always say as well in terms of when I'm teaching, if you're teaching something new or a new, um, a new learning objective or an outcome, don't try and do it whole class. I always tend to when I'm working with early years, we have a table or an area where I bring children over in maybe pairs or little groups so I can really talk to them about what they're doing. And those and I don't push children to come in and have a go. I set it up in a way that will interest them. I set it up with different themes so that I can really relate to all the children that are in that setting. So they're using technology in a way that interests them rather than being made to use it. Um, as I said, technology can be used to improve the quality of explanations by doing it and showing them and practically seeing it and talking about it. They, they have a fuller understanding, especially those children who have processing issues where they can't take on lots of instructions. Um, technology offers a really way to improve the impact of pupil practice and improving, as I said, assessment. So things like resources. So in the earlier setting, I haven't ever been into an earlier setting where they haven't got really, really fabulous resources. And I go in there and I'm kind of like a child at Christmas because there's so much there in terms of how you use it. And it's just about taking the resources that you've got and just adapting them to think about computational thinking. For example, I know lots, not lots of um, earlier settings have things like iPads and robots, but there's ways around it. So instead of, for example, on the left hand side there, instead of using a robot that can draw, using cars, talking about a journey that the, the cars are going on. Where did it start? Where is it going next? Where is it going to end? And I'll show you a resource that there is that I've built with Barefoot for this as well. But children love mark making. If you've got boys especially, I've got two boys and I've worked with a lot of boys that really just didn't like picking up a pencil. They happily picked up a car and started drawing and writing their name, writing letters that they knew, um, looking at displays around them to see if they could copy things, uh, creating journeys and talking about what their journeys were. So using things like cars, you know, in the in the environment, really good. Having a little area where children can relate to things like, you know, cassettes or um, CD players or anything. It doesn't matter what it is. 
just having a look at it and having that area. So I've got, for example, on the right hand side here at the bottom, keyboards, putting a keyboard into the um, into the area. I obviously know with COVID that we have to be careful of the resources that we do put in, but things like torches, kids love torches. The discussion that you can have around a torch, putting it into kind of a literacy area where the children have got books, they can go into a little wigwam or tent and they can read their book and put their torch on. And that discussion you can have over how the torch works and why it works. And, you know, there's just so much all to do with things like inputs and outputs. That's what it is. We're pre-teaching these things. Um, setting up role play areas where the children can do things like typing or um, having a go activities and asking the children, what types of jobs do you think you would have to use this type of you know technology? Where when would you use a keyboard? Have you seen anybody using one before? Have you got a keyboard in your house? These discussions really give you that good understanding of where the children are starting. Oh well, yeah, my parents. Da, da, da. The discussions the children have, and it just gives you that opportunity to have a you know a fuller understanding. Again, things like up the top here on the right hand side, I use so much Lego with children because it's just really good for unplugged activities. Things like, for example, um, on the top here, using the big, um, big, um, I was going to say dish, and it's not a dish, um, but setting up little mazes and asking the children how you get from one place to another and where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And starting to use things like, for example, when I'm talking to the children, I use, instead of just using symbols, I use actions. Are we going forwards or are we going backwards? The difference between forwards and backwards is the fact that when I'm going backwards, I can't see. I'm going to go backwards. Are we turning? And then you can start introducing that idea of right and left as the children progress. I wouldn't necessarily do it at the beginning. All I want to know is that difference between a turning action changes the direction and a forward and backwards motion lets me move forwards and backwards. So setting up things like this with all the resources you've got. I've done Easter activities, Christmas activities, um, seaside activities, all sorts of things. Um, I've done looked at hibernation where the children have created little um, They've had, they've had to go and they've had farmers where they've had to go and get all the collect all the sheep in and they've had to make an algorithm to tell me how to get the sheep and they've worked in pairs to do this so it doesn't have to when I'm showing you these resources if you have got access to things like robots and iPads that's brilliant use them but if you haven't don't worry and you don't need a lot in school to do it so why is computational thinking what is computational thinking it's a set of problem solving skills that we use in everyday life and as a as I started my career, I was a key stage two teacher and children asking you things like, do I need to wear my coat? Well, you need to decide. It's things like that, that we need to build up this. Well, you know, how are you going to solve that problem? Do you need to wear a coat? How are you going to solve the problem? Look outside. Is it raining or is it warm? Can you, you given the children, the children need to start thinking for themselves without being spoon fed. So we do this in early years. The children are asked to develop these key skills. So thinking about competition, competitional thinking is things that you're already doing. So Barefoot have brought out, and I've, I've got a link at the very, very end, so you don't have to go and hunt for all these things. Barefoot have brought out an, um, competitional thinking in early years overview, and it's been written. All the resources have been written by early years practitioners that really want to push computational thinking in the early years because we know that it's already being done and it's being done to a high standard, but just giving you the resources. So I won't go through this, but it just gives you lots of information about what computational thinking is and how we how it supports early years children. OK. But the idea is it breaks it down into these key things, which are concepts and approaches so the idea for this is there is a key stage one and a key stage two one but this is the early earliest ones and it's all to do with things like concepts looking at logical reason looking at abstraction well, what do you need what do you not need which bits can i take away and which bits do i need to do this activity you could do that through creating something in dt abstraction which bits are you going to use and which bits do you not how are you going to use that one why, why have you chosen that material rather than this one all the key questions that you would be asking your children looking for patterns. Oh, wh why is that the same as that? Or how is that different? And getting the children to explain, looking at algorithms. So instructions, children follow instructions all of the time, but it's understanding how to really, really process the steps of an instruction, which is something we're always working on with earliest children and uh, giving them and trying to get more than kind of one step or two step approaches. Um, decomposition, breaking down a problem and solving it. Well, what are we going to do first? How are we going to do that? Instead of telling them the answer, it's asking them to solve it. And I think through sometimes, and I know I've been kind of um, 
prone to doing it because I've got so much to do in my day. I give them the answer rather than exploring how I got to the answer. And if we don't let them have the journey of finding the answer, they're never going to really understand it and really own it. So it's this idea of putting the learning back on the children. How are we going to do this? Well, you know, what do you think I should do first? And then what am I going to do? Um, and then obviously the approaches which we do, tinkering. Children are constantly tinkering, playing and exploring, working out how things work, um, creating things, fixing things, collaborating with each other and understanding that there are different approaches and there's no one way of doing something. Perseverance is a massive one, which is not giving up, not giving up on something, going back to it, having a break if you need to, coming back to it and exploring it a bit further. But the whole thought of computational thinking is you will get it wrong a number of times before you get it right. So it's really building that in that if, you know, if there's one thing I want to kind of push really is that perseverance and awarding children for that effort of persevering. So scaffolding and effective questioning um, are a fundamental part of this. That's what we ask the children that's the most important. And I've just popped on at the bottom here, a link to the pedagogy in the early years for um, improving. It's like a, it's looking at approaches and policies of, of how we teach. But I've just popped that in, which supports this document, the computational thinker. So if you need to, and I've put this on the um, on the uh, last slide, I think it is second to last slide, you can actually get the prompt card. So if you find that you're asking the same questions or you're actually giving the children the answer rather than asking them the relevant question. Um, I can see Tracy and Georgia in a moment. I'll ask you if you want to just pop your mic on. But these cards, you can just make them into a lanyard and just have them. So if you want to really focus on one key skill like abstraction or decomposition, there's some little prompt questions that might trigger you in terms of asking questions in a slightly different way. Tracy and Georgia, do you want to pop your mic on? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. Um, it's just to uh, I put it in the chat, but just I'm sure the answer is yes. But will we get a copy of all this afterwards? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll send um, an email out to everybody because I've got all of your emails. What I'll do is I'll just send um, a job lot of emails out to everybody with the slide deck in just so you can access it. It just means you don't have to go hunting for things. Because it be on the STEM part. website as well on the, you know, under this course. I can put it on there. That would be absolutely fine. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll email you anyway, just so that yeah. I know you've okay. definitely got it. Um, but if you've got any questions, it means you've got my email and you can always ask yeah. me back anything. Okay. okay. Thank you. So what does this look like in the classroom? As I've said, you are doing computational thinking already. You're doing it really, really well. So, for example, what I've done is I've pulled out the key aspects of the earliest curriculum and I've just put the title so I can show you how this kind of links in. All of the photographs of children I work with, so for example, planning and sequencing stories, communication, understanding how things are sequenced and using any text that you've got as a, as a vehicle. Texts are really good and it really engages the children. So this is just a picture of the child um, creating his own story. I used iMotion with, the, with his, all he had to do was click his finger, move his model, click his finger, move his model, click his finger. And once he got into that repetitive part of it, he just I just left him be. And this was this little boy was three um, on the right hand side, using things like your paint trays. So, for example, I've got a robot here, but you don't have to use a robot to do it. I had a sequence of activities. So this was related to um, a story, I think it was Burglar Bill and um, the children we had a, it was a shopping thing that we were doing in the classroom so I said to them right what we need to do is match up the shop and the product that you buy at the shop so if it's a barbers you know what would we use at the barbers and for example the scissors so the children I, I just wanted to see if they could make those links between what shops sell and you know the item so I just asked them with a paintbrush which got the boys really involved and really good for fine motor skills, brushing the sand away to get a little track to that area. And they talked about the track, so moving forwards, going, turning, going along. Then what we did is, after we'd done that, the children had to go at using a Sphero here, this little robot in the middle here, and they tried to get the robot to get there along their track. Absolutely loved it. They found out straight away that if they hadn't pushed enough sand out the way, the robot couldn't get through. So there was the debugging and perseverance and they were really keen to do it. So they might have just matched up two. We had a really good discussion and then they went away and did something else. But it linked to what was happening in the earlier settings at the same time. So you can just see they were thinking about logical reasoning. How were they going to get there? How were they going to turn? They noticed that he liked to travel in straight lines rather than curved lines because it was harder. Um, the collaboration and they started helping each other because they realised their friend was maybe finding it hard to get the sand out of the way. So they were collaborating and talking about how they were going to get there. So a range of skills, absolutely loads within a kind of five minute, five, ten minute activity. 
understanding of the world again the way in, the way in which children see the world now is very different to when i first started teaching there's a lot of things like reality versus imaginary augmented reality it's part the children see it all the time when they're outside of school so for example it, there are free activities and websites you can get where the children can you can download it and even if you've got one tablet or something in your um room that you can use just to show them this it doesn't have to be having lots of ipads but my son absolutely loved this he's in an earlier setting and he the, the talking that we got from having a live tiger and elephant in our in our garden was fantastic did it in earlier settings and the children understood that it was an imaginary that we talked about where these animals came from we went and had a look at the map about where these animals came from and what the what the weather was like there and what you know what the setting and the environment looked like the talk that came from just a simple little activity um another app that you can get for things like ipads is something called quiver i've used this for all sorts of uses for Christmas. We did at Van Gogh where the children created Starry Night. You can see at the very top, they scanned the image and it made a little bauble of their Starry Night. So that we used painting, we used art, but then we linked it with technology so that there was a purpose at the end and the children were at, thought it was magical, thought it was magical and absolutely loved it. Um, literacy. Books are an amazing way in. If you think about your topics before you even think about computing, you know, engagement of all the children is key children love to hear stories activities need to be purposeful so we can always link back to what the story is being mindful of all learners so making sure that any learner that we've got in that classroom has the access to um this computational thinking and using technology to, to that they might use at home so really kind of pushing it and asking them you know to have a go at these kind of things when they go home so just on the right hand side here you can see lots of different activities i set up in an earlier setting when it was all related to this super potato book so the children had to go and collect things um, they had to create um, models all sorts of different things they had to go and find all of save all the vegetables with the um the little ca caterpillar robot we did loads of things but because the children had a purpose they wanted to do it so for example i think for this one i made a super potato and i put him in uh, a tub and froze him and i said to the children the more activities they managed to complete we could see if we were going to get super potato out of the freezer and they absolutely loved it so by the end of the session they felt fantastic because they'd managed to save super potato by doing all these activities so just simple things like that topic based um books really good so if you've got doing seaside or if you're going on adventures to places collecting resources that you go you know if you go into the beach collecting things and bringing them into the classroom so for example we had a pirate activity where the children had to use a robot here to go around and collect um the things to make a i think it was to make a, um an octopus and here they had to go and collect fish over here it was um the pirates had stolen the treasure so how are we going to get the robots to go around and collect the the treasure but it was all related to sequencing and a storybook so this one a hole at the bottom of the sea added in the music aspect because it had music that goes along with it um, children loved it it was sequencing as well and it was developing so we know what came first second third and what came last so it's building up all these skills that you can use story sequencing and retelling great opportunity for children to understand what sequencing is part of an algorithm building up that sequence so this one i just used um i, I can't remember what the story was now Yes, sorry, I'll, I've completely gone out of my head, but then, for example, I just made this mat up of um, A4 paper, just printed, so I don't have to, I don't go out and buy things, or if I have bought it for something else, I reuse it in a different way, which I'll show you in a moment. But if you've got things like, um, which lots of earlier settings have, things like this, which are things like shopping lists from, I think it's the Orchard Toys, um, earliest resources you can get all sorts of things like this um i've got ones to do with um space i just reuse these in a way that i just use mats or uh, masking tape put it out on the floor and i use resources i've already got i don't go away and start buying extra things okay oh yeah brilliant thank you michael totally i don't know why i can't remember the hungry caterpillar i've, I've cut out as many of these things as i can so i should know it by now but it's all to do with this idea of sequencing and what came first, how many. So we, we brought in the idea of number, how many pears did he have, how many uh, blueberries did he have, how many oranges did he have, and we built it up. Again, these are resources that I've helped create for Barefoot, um, but 
this mathematical aspect so for example i don't understand why shape was it's not such a focus in early years now for some reason i i just can't understand i, I know the earlier settings i work in they do really push it anyway um but this idea of um seaside tangrams and understanding when children hit key stage one and key stage two this idea of looking at shape in different orientations is a really really big big area and if we bring, bring it in in kind of early years it gives that children an understanding that a triangle looks like a triangle in any different orientation so rotating it it's still a triangle if it's in a slightly different um uh, format still a triangle because it's got these properties so the idea is that children get a sheet i did this with them and i had a go at the activity with these girls at the same time i showed them and talked to them about the seaside had they been what have they seen and we started creating a picture and this is the picture that the little girl you can see here has created and she created a little um, lighthouse with a boat and she explained why she used different shapes to create that picture if you want to so for example it's all to do with tinkering creating collaborating because we shared our shapes um persevering because we had to keep moving things around and the idea at the end is the children had a brilliant little bit of work that they could go away so i have created a little link here at the very bottom of me doing this task with the children and talking to them while we did it and it was it was a really nice one color collection another one that was created this was to do with data handling and understanding um what data is and well, what what we what do we do with things when we collect them? So going on a journey and collecting. I can see somebody's got their hand up. I'm just going to see who it is. Tracy and George again. So is it? Uh, do, I, th I think you spoke before, didn't you? Tracy and George, do you want to put your mic on? I can see a little hand there. If you want to, just stick it on. That's absolutely fine. So we went out and collected things in the environment. It could be done in the school environment. It could be done, you know, children collecting things and bringing them in we went on a little walk and then we came back and we started sorting them and i said well what kind of things have you got are they similar are they different what what bits are the same and immediately he picked out color he found the things that were yellow or white or a mixture and he put them into little groups and then i said right well we'll find a sorting circle and we'll put the things into the sorting circle and we'll decide and then things that were a slightly different color he was kind of he, hi georgia can you hear me yeah sorry our computer's playing up it's not we're not we don't have any any questions all oh, right right i'll carry on if you do just feel free to put your hand up um so obviously you started looking at a sorting circle this doesn't have to be all done in one go it can be done over a week or however long you want to do it and then i just put some masking tape down on the floor and i said can we build a tower of these things to see how many there are um and then he started comparing it and immediately he said to me i said so and i purposely said oh there's more of this one because this object's bigger and he went no and I said well that no because that that bit look at that bit's bigger isn't it that column's bigger and he said no and I said well how do you know and immediately started counting one two three four five one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two three and he started comparing immediately that's the result things that we might be teaching in key stage one it's fine to start talking about it in early years. He understood and he compared data and he told me just because something's bigger doesn't mean there's more of it. So he understood quantity. And just by being a fool and asking him those questions, he, he shared with me. And then we took it on to um, J2E. You can get this as a free resource. You, could, you don't have to um, buy into it. It's a free resource. And I think I've created a little video as well of this and it just shows how to use the little resource. You could do it for animals, safari animals, colours, anything that you're doing. So if you've got any resources like little animals in school, you could put them in and say, how are we going to sort these? Can you put them into different groups? So it doesn't have to be about colour. It's This is just one I've used. It could be about any resource that you're using in school, any topic that you're doing. But there is support there and just working with children to show them this and how the bar gets bigger as they put, you know, the quantity gets higher. Um, again, things like number recognition. I love using things like Numicon. If you've got Numicon in school, getting that understanding that when I look at five, that's what five looks like. When I look at seven, the quantity related to the number. So as I, you can see, I just put the digits out and we, we worked with this these children for quite some time in terms of numbers recognition from number one to ten. Um, and you can see this was kind of in the in the summer term the children started relating numbers and then children started to add numbers they said well this is seven because i've made it from this and this i was just blown over because i thought that was fantastic and then we started looking at 
because they they told me that we started looking at the teen numbers and understanding how to make 11 and 12 and 13 and because they understood the 10 and then obviously the units the ones they started adding them together so it was brilliant it was it just built that learning on but because there was a robot and an activity where they had to set it up they wanted to do it so it just obviously encouraged discussion number recognition playing to learn collaborating yeah if anything i would say i use i use so much masking tape because it can set an area and make it you know you can use it for roots you can set a little perimeter of things that you want to use the children work really really well when they're seeing and it means you don't have to have um all the fancy mats with all the grids on you don't have to go and buy stuff like that um even things like using um these play boards on the right hand side here with the little boy here um matty just making the playboards and using uh, Duplo if you've got it and asking children to build towers. Are they going to make patterns? How are they doing it? How many blocks are they going to use? Have they got enough blocks? How many more do they need? All these key things or the language that you can use with it. So again, expressive arts and design. Creativity is a key to an activity. And if it's purposeful, the kids love it. If there's a reason to do it, the children love it more. So children developing a character by collecting leaves. So this was um, a book called Leaf Man. Love it for autumn. It's a brilliant book. Um, and it's all to do with a journey. So you can do all the sequencing. And then at the end of this activity, what we did is we had an activity where I gave the kids the picture cards. So I just literally took pictures of the, the book, snapshot of them, and the children had to create a, an algorithm to get the, the, the story in sequence. And then one of the activities was I wanted to really see if the children could control the robot and understood how to use it, um, that they then designed their own leaf man. So this is a little girl that I work with and she created her own little leaf man. So absolutely, she absolutely loves art and design. So I had to build something for her to engage her, to bring her over, to make her want to do it. And the fact she created a carrot and she could take it home and share it with her parents, she loved it. So which leaf are you going to use for the body? How are you going to get there? Why have you chosen it? So all things where I'm asking their opinion and asking them what their thoughts are rather than telling them. Another one here, um, this was an activity. Yes, it's resources that I would use in key stage one or key stage two, but I set it up because I wanted the children to understand that they had power to influence something so for example this little boy came over um and touched these foil pots as soon as he touched them he realized it made a sound and he stood back and went how is that working what is what's happening here and immediately we had a really good discussion that he was controlling the computer by touching them with his hand and then he realized they played different notes so we started talking about music and notes and how some were higher and some were lower and then he could tap them and build up a little rhythm like a drum and we talked about what he had at home yeah makey makey that's what this is just here i don't expect children to program the makey makey but there's no reason they can't talk about it and understand how it works and why it works because this is part of, you know, this is, you know, when you've got a dance mat at home, this is how it works. When you touch it, you send a message to the computer and understanding these things and just talking about it. So it really started to um, have an impact on debugging and exploring and how it worked and why one stopped working and why metal was used. And we just started talking about all these things. Another one, we had to go at something called Pizza Fun where we had a pizza shop in the early years in the role play. The children were creating pizzas and I wanted to really focus in on this idea of shape. So we created a pizza, but it was created. The toppings were shapes, shapes. I knew that the children were maybe struggling with. I mean, I know there's an arrow in there, but we talked we talked about that. But some of the shapes so the children had to send their robot as a chef down to collect the shapes to create their own pizza. Sometimes they were given a recipe card, so they understood that the recipe meant the number of that. They had to go and collect that amount of that um, um, topping. And then in the end, they just had to go create their little pizza. It was all made out of card and it was I just had it in a little wallet, put it out and just use masking tape to make it look a little, a little bit more attractive. So they had to decide where they were going to go. Um, understanding of the world. So another one here. For example, we were looking at hibernation and the children talked about animals that hibernate, what that actually meant. Um, and we talked about how they get ready for winter and things like that and what they have to do. So we turned a robot into a squirrel. I just found just typed in Google, I think squirrel, um, squirrel net or something like that. Found this little shape of a squirrel, as you can see, cut it out, coloured it. The kids coloured it in with me. We stuck it on the robot and he turned into a squirrel and they had to go and collect the acorns. 
and they had to try and collect as many as they could to beat their friend and then we started putting numbers on the back of them so that when we started adding the numbers up they could see who got the highest score so they were really kind of competitively working against each other but we just used all natural resources in the classroom we had a little area where the children started bringing things in like the acorns when they'd gone on walks and things like that and they started collecting things so we linked it to what was happening already in the nursery we didn't didn't go off on a tangent it was what they were already doing and lots of earlier settings have these wooden blocks they're brilliant for creating mazes or having an obstacle to make it harder so you can be, keep leveling it up to make it harder and harder for the children um we put in, asked the children to go and um, collect natural things they wanted off the display so that the display was being used it wasn't just there for to look pretty go and get things off the display and we'll put them out for the squirrels so that the squirrels feel like they're in the forest what kind of things do you want and then we started talking about the different plants that came down and why you know you know evergreens it, their discussion was brilliant but it was all about helping these squirrels to survive um the hibernation this was one i talked about earlier on about that idea about the um cars with the pens in this is um, an activity part of summer fun i know it says summer fun for barefoot but it's it can be done you could do this for any time of the year really um but it's this idea of trying to get um children who are not necessarily eager to pick up a pencil who or who need to develop a pencil skill in terms of the grip okay and the idea of this is to talk about a journey the children have been on they might have experienced it with you or they might be talking about an experience they that, that they've been on with their parents and all I did was I created, I just got A3 paper, I think it was, put it all down on the floor and I drew a road and I said, well, where's our journey? Where did you start? And and the, the, obviously the child started to explain to me where, the, where they started. And I said, can you draw that? How does it look? You know, what is it a big building? Is it a small building? Where is it? Has it got things around it? And immediately he started to sketch and draw it. Because he started to sketch it, another child then came in and started talking about, oh, yeah, I've been on that journey. If you go down the road, there's this and this and this. And then they started to add in their ideas. So as you can see, by the end, I think it was a, um, a journey that we've, we've been on to school and where, where we would what we would see on the way. But there was all sorts of things like factories. And we talked about the factories and why they were there, and what they did. Um, houses, so how some houses are bigger. It, it was really lovely in terms of that chatter. But then after that, what we did, and if I look back at what the children were doing, they were using their logic, they were creating an algorithm because it was a sequence of what they saw, and they were debating whether they were putting things in the right place because did they see that first or next or last or in between these two? They were creating, they were collaborating, and they were tinkering. So by the end, um, the children were invited to go and get things like they could get little Duplo characters or cars or Lego or whatever, bring it down, and they started role playing. I said, oh, I'm going to go here shopping. I'm going to go here first. Or, you know, I'm going to go back to the car and put this in here because I've got too much shopping. So there was lots of chatter. Um, there is an app that you can get on um, iPads now called Puppet Pals 2. Not Puppet Pals, but Puppet Pals 2. And it's a really good thing for animation in terms of children understanding how characters move. And what you can do is you can either get the freebie or you can purchase it. Um, and it, you can link it to literally any topic like safari, space, all sorts of different things. So it just means that the children can do something unplugged. But then if you have got access to things like iPads, you can use something to, you know, develop it a little bit further. And there's lesson plans. When I say lessons at the top here, I think there's one back here as well. I'll go back to this one. If it's lesson, this means that this is a lesson plan. There's a lesson resource and I'll show you how to get onto that in a moment. OK, but all of this there's lots of effective questions that you could use and it gives you a scaffold of how each area like algorithms creating collaborating can be you, how you can tackle it and the type of questions you can ask and it gives you some models that you can just fill in so another one here boats ahoy it's an activity that most i think probably most early years people have actually done anyway but it was in this activity i just gave the children um and it was linked to this obviously summer um summer fun activities but i said right we're going to create a boat and i just gave them lots of materials that in one area and i said what which of these materials should we use to make a boat immediately they started picking out things um I said, oh, well, you know, how are we going to test? What, what do we need to do if we, if we want to create a boat out of this? Immediately plonk it in the water to see if it worked. 
and then they started you know abstraction i need this one but i'm not going to use this one so that's going to go away so that idea of abstraction i picked up the stone and went oh i'm going to make a stone out of um, a boat out of a stone this little boy is non-verbal his face told me the story straight away he didn't really he doesn't really speak much and immediately kind of looked at me and went and i could tell from his eyes that he knew exactly that not to use that resource and start, he started laughing when i put it in the water and obviously we can see that it's sunk there so this idea of abstraction looking for the resources that would support logical reasoning when we started developing our boat and creating it children quickly worked out we put a i think it was a um a um tea towel a cut up tea towel as the sail and as soon as the boat fell over the towel got soaking wet and it was really heavy and it kept toppling over that's debugging so the children found i said so this isn't working is it what else could we use and they went over and picked out the resources picked out the tracing paper but as soon as the tracing paper went in the water they realized the um sorry the grease proof paper the water started to run off it and i said well what does that mean i'll show you some of the robots in a minute um Anita, that I'll, I've got a few in front of me that I can show you. Um, and as soon as we, I said, well, what, what's that when water doesn't go into a material? What does, what's that word? I can't remember. And he said, oh, waterproof. And I said, oh, what things have we got that waterproof? Oh, my coat when I come to school. And this is a little boy, the boy on the left with the um, blonde hair. Immediately, his understanding of um, absorbing, soaking in water, all the key language I wanted to. So immediately from that talk with him, I had a really good understanding of what types of things he understands and the vocabulary he wants to use and then obviously testing and evaluating we kept tinkering it's not working so what are we going to fix how are we going to fix it and i support them scaffolded it but i'd let them do it and there's a little video of that task as well so if you do want to see that scientific inquiry um this was just a, a robot i mean you don't have to use a robot you can use magnets to do it it doesn't have to be a robot but the idea of the concept is there um, children, I said, right, we're going to create a maze. Go off and do it. I'm going to give you a mat. Because they'd had this scaffolded to them quite often, they just got the foam bricks and they made a barrier around the outside to stop him falling off. They explained to me where they were going to put the bricks. These mats as well that I've got here, they're just from B&Q. I think it's maybe um, £10 for six or something like that. And all I do is I put masking tape on them fold them up and stick them in the cupboards if i do want to do an activity outside which i love i'm always outside with the kids it means that i can transport it outside and do an activity outside if i want to so we just put the mats down the children started putting their bricks down they collaborated and discussed and they were talking oh you can't put that there because you can't get around here and if you do this so i just let them be and just sat back and just listened to them and wrote notes of what they were saying um setting challenges so i put five pence coins out lots of different five pence coins and i put the robot out and immediately i just let them explore they found out that the robot started picking up the five pence pieces so immediately they started wanting him to collect all of them but then they realized he didn't collect some of them and it was because the five pence pieces were made out of a different material that was non-magnetic straight away so much learning from just putting five pence pieces out with magnets on on a mat um but you could have things like this if you set it up bigger you could have the child as the robot with the magnet in the hand and they've got to be directed forward turn all these different things that the children could do but we really started talking about you know this idea of magnets how we you know things that were metal around the around the invite around our um nursery and the children then went into the role play area got the magnets and they would start going around testing things and they understood quite quickly what was magnetic and what was not so it was a, it was a really lovely activity so what we try to do is, and I've popped this in here, that we try not to, children, especially in early years, their cognitive load, we have to be really careful that the, that when we give instructions, that we don't overload this idea of their cognitive load. So, for example, I've put here, there are two key stresses on cognitive load for learners, and it's giving them too much breaking things down into obviously smaller tasks for them, modeling it so that they can see it happening. Even if they walk past and they see you doing it with another child, being able to watch other people do things, because that's how we learn. That's how adults learn by watching and seeing it in um, seeing it happen. Um, being able to. It's really important as well, the gap between their existing understanding and the new talk, new skill being taught. Sometimes we might need to revisit this a couple of times to allow them to build that link between their current knowledge and this new knowledge. They might not get it straight away that if we keep doing things in, even if it's a different topic, but still building on that um, 
that objective that we want or that little um, process is really, really important. So building, having the same same activity, but lots of times with lots of different topics, really, really important. Um, making the process visible to the learner. If I see something, I'm a visual learner and a kinesthetic learner. If I see it and do it, I can generally do it again. Same with going somewhere, I can get there again in the car. All children are very different. Some children might just like to sit and listen, but they won't watch because they're auditory learners. So looking at your style of the, uh, the children in your in your setting and understanding how they best like to learn, and they might tell you. Um, making sure that there's not too much increased load on the learner and um, and helping sometimes making those connections and asking them and scaffolding the questions so that they can make the connections. So characteristics of effective learning. These move through all areas of the um, early years curriculum, playing, exploring, active learning, creating and thinking critically, motivated learners. But what we really need to decide when we set up an activity is what does it actually allow exploration? Am I butting in too much like and not allowing them just to explore it before I talk to them so that they can start talking about what they're thinking? Is it actually meaningful? Is there a purpose to what we're doing? Because we don't do anything as adults unless there's a purpose to it. So we can't expect children just to go away and do something because we've told them to. We need their, it to be a story behind it or a reason to do it. Um, does it give children um, a chance to practice skills? So do we, if there is a skill that we really want to teach, for example, is it writing? Is it, you know, hold that pencil grip, the activities that we give children? And is the learning in context so that the children can absorb it? So I popped on here very quickly. Um, this is something I made up because I wanted to see the progression from early years and it was all to do with um, computer science because it was the area that children, that adults felt less secure with and it starts from the left and works mapping over to the right hand side and it's just key things I spotted with children about their understanding um, and obviously I won't read it to you, you can have a look at it but it just gives you that understanding of where they might actually be in terms of what they're showing you and how they're going to move on. Um, just some different things you can use and resources. This is um, STEM over in Cumbria um, have, have teamed up with BA Systems um, to create these, um, they're called um, uh, engineering fairy tales. So it's all stories, all fairy tales that you might read the children, but they're read by um, STEM representatives. So it might be somebody from the army, it might be somebody from industry, and they read a slightly different version of the fairy tale. And it's just there's loads of activities you can explore. So if you want to read a story to the children in a different way, you could maybe share this with them that they actually see somebody different. And it's it's all to do with this gender uh, imbalance in terms of, you know, are all people in the army male or, fe you know, female who is in the army and what kind of jobs do they do? And it just opens children up to this idea. Um, nearly done. So um, apologies for talking and talking, but just in terms of your your setting, Things like cooking. Cooking is such a good way of bringing in that early years computational thinking, understanding inputs and outputs. So when I press a button, it something happens on the blender. When I press a button on the keyboard, music is played. Um, having that little area where the children might investigate um, resources that you've got, things that might not work that you can take in and, uh, and pull apart with the children and have an understanding of how what what's inside, if what's inside this case, like toys that don't work anymore. Brilliant, uh, brilliant way of doing it. I've also taken as well the um, there's cards on um, on barefoot that you can use and the pictures didn't really relate to early as I didn't think so although they're fantastic with key stage one and key stage two I just took a clip art and stuck it over the top um, so decomposition is breaking it down which bits do I need to make my cake these are all the ingredients what which bits do I need to make this tinkering about playing and experimenting seeing how things work um, evaluating has anybody got a good idea of what we need to do here and how we're going to do it persevering about yet yeah, you know when we find something hard you know when we're walking up a big hill we've got to keep going and keep going even though we're tired um things like your um visual planners um i know these are used for children um with sen but i think they're just brilliant for generally classes identify a sequence of the day and what we're actually going to do is that in the afternoon or is it in the morning is it after lunch or before lunch or when we go home so these visual timetables are really good um things like using an algorithm for um washing your hands how do we wash our hands and what does it look like it's in an order if two children start to see numbers and they start to see pictures they know it's a sequence of events so it's an algorithm and very very quickly on the last one 
where to find all these resources. So some of these resources are scattered all over the place. So what I've done is um, with Isabella, who also works for Barefoot, um, we've created a little link with all the resources in one place. So it just means when you click on that link, you can go to a page and it's got all loads of different resources I've talked about. Um, but what I'll do, I think, open for questions. So I'll stop sharing that screen there so I can see. And I've also got, hopefully it'll stop sharing. There, I think I've stopped sharing now. In terms of things like resources, I know I was talking to you before. I'm just going to quickly take off my filter off my screen because I think it'll stop me from sharing. Uh, apply there. Things like I was talking to you before about resources you might have. Things like these packs, the bingo sets and things like that for um, orchard toys. I think you can get these for like five pound off Amazon. Brilliant because there's little pictures and sequencing things that you might want to use. You can get things like shopping lists. I think I've got a safari animals one as well. Brilliant. I don't need to go away and make resources. I can just ask the children to use these. Um, just pop those there. I think places like if you're ever in places like B&M or Home Bargains, brilliant for things like this. I got when I went on to Amazon to have a look at how much these little Lego boards were. So expensive. I can use Duplo or Lego on these to build up mazes or to get an algorithm from one place to another and how the children are going to build it up. Loads of resources like that that you can use. Um, I'm going to quickly show you. These are robots that I use. Sometimes they're harder to get. This one is literally like a bee bot, but much, much cheaper. Um, these are, There's not so many of these about, but you can get same the kind of same robot. So these are by Clem on Tony. So if you ever need... Um, resources don't always go for the hope magazine um because they're so expensive and i think these robots when i got them were kind of like 30 pound which is a third of the price of a bee bot these are just buttons that you can press on the top this one here is called the clementoni mind but as you can see on the back and um, the children you can program him with the buttons you can draw shapes with him you can speak to him through a microphone and tell him how to travel you can use an ipad with him and i use this robot from early years right up to year five because i can teach obtuse and acute angles with this robot because you can build an algorithm and set all of the parameters for it so this robot is a really really good one there's another one as well that i use i don't think he was very expensive actually i think he was maybe about 40 pounds but the amount that you get with him, I'll just put him over there at play. As you can see, all the resources, you get things like little uh, cubes and things like that, and little hands and little faces. You can get things to collect. You can get things like this. I'm just going to grab it out. Little cones to tell him where he wants to go. And this is a little robot I use with my children called Botley, and he's from Learning Resources. And you get a little remote like this and all these things i mean they're relatively you know 40 50 pounds is quite cheap for a robot that you can get but you only need one you don't need to go and buy five ten a whole class set you just buy the resources that you need in terms of what's available to you so these are all robots that i use and i would say in terms of you know batteries and things like that and they they are very i mean i've used these for years now with children and i haven't had to replace them only pens for this one here that's all i've ended up having to get they're really quite robust robots and it gives children a chance to explore and as soon as they see things like this they're immediately interested so i know i've chatted i know there's only a couple of minutes left so has anybody got any questions or anything that i've said so far or they want to just ask please do put your mic on and just kind of or put your hand up if anybody's got any questions or any comments that you want to make in terms of what you've seen so far. We're all very quiet. Oh, excellent. We've got, I can see Jay Stafford. Do you want to pop your mic Hi. on? Hi. Hiya. Hello. Hiya, you all right? It was just brilliant. Thank you. I think just relating to what we're doing early years, realising that it is computational thinking without even realising. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. And it's like, I honestly do send, I'd normally send year five and six teachers down to see early years. And I said, just look at what they're doing. They're not, they're not asking, they're not asking questions. They're just going for it. But I just think it's, um, it's good to see it happening and to see that children as young as that can decide for themselves without yeah, being told. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I would. Yes, I would and really like you said at the start, such a shame that technology is taken out of the curriculum, but it can be used, can't it, to enhance. To be honest. Area. 
I, I know that's what, yeah, it's the enhancement. It's enhancing what you're already doing by adding in if it's necessary. But there's so many ways of doing unplugged activities that you're building on those ideas, those principles, by just having that poster in your classroom, maybe and going, oh, we're tinkering today, or we're, you know, we're going to collaborate because we're going to talk to each other about our thoughts. It's really quite important to the children as well. Um, Thank Lin you. All right, Lindsay. Lindsay White. I don't know if you want to put your mic on. I can see some chats, comments in the chat. Even if you want to pop it in the chat, that's absolutely fine. Um, I mean, you said this was absolutely amazing to see. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Time to be back. Excellent. Well, I'll send this recording. I've obviously recorded this session today, so the recording I can kind of give you so you can share share it with you. And you've got the slides. So if you want to use the slides with your early years team or your key stage one team, feel free. They're, they're there for you. Um, but yeah, if anybody has got any questions or, you know, it's it's brilliant now to kind of we've got I know we've got you know the last kind of week of school and with you know I start thinking about things for September in terms of how I might tweak things or what I'm what I don't want you to think that is you have to go away and start changing everything to because you're already doing it it's just talking about it in a slightly different way or having those opportunities for those children to have a go at things so you know for example looking at the activities that you put out for children that encourage children to come across that which key skill are you looking at and how how would you change your questioning to support that so i hope it has been helpful um i know it's a minute a minute away from kind of 10 o'clock and thank you very much for coming along i really do appreciate it but i just didn't want you to think that i was a one of these people that comes along and says these are all the things i think you should be doing they're kind of things i do and I really am quite passionate about early years and I think it's an area that I'm so pleased now that there's actually resources for because I think you know sometimes when you go to staff meetings it's not always relating to what you're doing and I think people can learn a lot from what you are actually doing in your environment and seeing you know hopefully when we can start doing things like learning walks you know show off show what you do show what the kids are doing and you know talking about and how you relate things to topics because I think you know you're doing an awesome job so i hope everybody um has a lovely summer holiday if you've got any questions please don't you know feel that you can't give me a quick email but i'll send all the resources out to you that i've um i've made for the last you know for this session so thank you very much i really appreciate it and i'll see you hopefully all very soon excellent thank you thank all you right, very much. thank you thanks if anybody's got any questions, feel free to stay on and just ask them.